Ryan's job is making sure the city's traffic signal controllers work, even in the worst possible weather. I wonder if Joe liked his new job as much as his old desk job. Under normal conditions, traffic signal control equipment works as expected. Drivers navigate easily through intersections, and traffic flows smoothly. It's those unusual conditions that create havoc on the street. You've likely been caught there yourself. As a traffic systems professional, you can help eliminate the frustration caused by damaged traffic control equipment. In this video, we describe transient events that can affect the operation of traffic control equipment. We recommend devices to protect the controllers from these events and describe the differences in the devices. We'll show you where to place and how to install the devices in the controller cabinet. We also discuss grounding and bonding, as well as shielding practices and maintenance procedures. The user's manual that accompanies this presentation contains charts, schematics, and additional details. From time to time, we'll refer you to the manual for more specific information. We recommend that you study the manual. Keep it handy on the job for quick reference. Background information, design assistance, and performance specifications are available in the National Cooperative Highway Research Program at NCHRP Report 317, titled Transient Protection, Grounding and Shielding of Electronic Traffic Control Equipment, available from the Transportation Research Board. Lightning is the most severe natural threat to traffic control. Southeastern states, area east of the Rockies, experience the highest number of thunderstorm days per year. When lightning strikes a power system, it creates a power surge in the distribution lines that travels into traffic control equipment. But even during normal operation of a power system, power surges and switching transients can upset controller operations. Broadcast systems and other radio transmitters can also interfere with traffic control. A threat commonly experienced in the cold, dry regions is electrostatic discharge that results from component contact by maintenance personnel. All of these electromagnetic threats can enter the controllers along several paths. The most common path is the power line, followed by communication cables. Other paths are support cables, pole grounds, vehicle detector loops, signal leads, any other cables entering the cabinet, like a pedestrian push button. Openings in the controller cabinet, like door seams and vents, can also provide a path for electromagnetic energy to enter the cabinet. When a threat enters the cabinet, it can upset circuits or destroy components. This illustration shows that the transients produced by these threats can easily exceed the tolerance levels of circuit components. To protect controller equipment from these transients, you establish barriers in strategic locations. Common barriers are current limiters, voltage limiters, and electromagnetic or radio frequency shields. Current limiters consist of fuses, resistors, and inductors. Voltage limiters are spark gaps, metal oxide varistors, and diodes. Electromagnetic shields are metal enclosures around the circuit to be protected. Filters can be both a current limiter and a voltage limiter. These barriers can be used individually or in combination, but for any of these barriers to work, they must be properly grounded and bonded. The most commonly used protector is the lightning arrestor. There are several types of arrestors. Spark gap. metal oxide bristers, and diodes. Carbon blocks and neon balls may even be found in older equipment. However, their slow response time makes them useless for protecting modern solid-state electronics. Traditionally, spark gaps have been the most widely used type of arrest. The two types are air gap, gas tube. Gas tubes are encapsulated electrodes filled with trace amounts of radioactive gas. 
The ones preferred for traffic controllers are gas-filled because of their predictable firing point. Two electrode and three electrode versions are available. Two electrode spark gaps can be used on single-ended communication lines or pedestrian push buttons. Three electrode spark gaps can be used on balanced data lines. Gas tube arresters have two outstanding features. They can handle high energy surges and the three electrode types protect conductor pairs simultaneously. On the downside, the delayed firing time can let damaging energy reach susceptible components, and they are not self-extinguishing on DC-powered circuits. They can cause significant AC line distortion with loss of signal timing. The AC line frequency is used for signal timing. Far gaps can also stay on long after the transient has ended, blowing fuses, breaking. Metal oxide baristers, or MOVs, are growing in popularity as transient limiters. MOVs have extremely fast response time. They can clip even the fastest transients. MOVs can limit transients with both positive and negative polarities. They occupy very little space and are inexpensive. But MOVs are limited in the amount of energy they can handle compared to spark gaps. Also, the high capacitance of MOVs can distort signals on data, inductive loop vehicle detector lines. Other devices are also used as transient protectors. By themselves, silicon avalanche suppressors and Zener diodes offer fast response time, but only unipolar protection. Packages are available that incorporate silicon avalanche suppressors, Zener diodes to offer bipolar protection. Silicon avalanche suppressors are often used after high-energy MOVs and spark gaps to clip the fast-rising leading edges of transients. As a transient suppressor, the common neon indicator light has an excessive turn-on time, so it's not recommended as a lightning protection device. Fuses and circuit breakers by themselves are not effective transient suppressors, but they're often used to limit the current flow, which follows the firing of other arrests. Low-pass filters can be used to limit high-frequency transient energy into susceptible circuits, too. And they also keep radio frequency energy out. So certain kinds of circuits can be protected by individual suppressors. Experts agree that the best protection against transients and radio frequency energy is a combination of one or more suppressors and a radio frequency filter in proper order. This schematic shows the proper ordering of a gas tube arrestor low-pass filter, and metal oxide baristers for maximum AC line protection. A high-energy MOV is used to absorb the bulk of a high-energy transient and is placed closest to the cabinet entry point of the penetrating cable. The fast-acting MOV is located on the circuit side of the protector to prevent the leading edge of the transient from destroying the circuit. The filter must be located between the two suppressors. To provide the delay necessary, the high energy MOV to fire before the low energy MOV fire. The spark gap is placed between the neutral wire and ground since timing will not be affected. The filter eliminates low level interference that isn't high enough in amplitude to operate the transient suppressor. An integrated package is the ideal, but you can achieve the same result with discrete elements. Economy and space restraints will determine the appropriate configuration. When properly installed, either the integrated package or discrete component assures a viable protection. There are several commercially available integrated package suppressors for use in AC power, telephone, and other communications input. Make sure you use the appropriate suppressor for the input you want to protect to avoid signal distortion and circuit upset. When you select an integrated package, you need to be sure that it's tested to accepted lightning test specifications like IEEE standard 587-1980. NCHRP report 317 recommends test levels, wave shape, number of pulses, and other test conditions for controller assembly. If you specify suppressors that meet UL 1449, be aware that the lightning test conditions specified in UL 1449 are not as severe as the spec in NCHRP 317. 
and be sure to get certified test data and circuit schematic so you know what you're buying. Also help other maintenance and repair personnel. The guidelines in the user's manual can help you select a combination that's best for your particular situation. Proper installation of an arrestor is essential no matter which arrestor you choose. Optimum placement depends on the location of the control equipment within the cabinet. We'll start with a model configuration, but remember, in all instances, the protector must be placed where it will limit the voltage difference across susceptible components to safe values. The best possible cabinet would look like this. All external cables are brought in through a penetration box. The lightning protectors are mounted inside this box. The protectors are well bonded to the penetration box and the input and output conductors are isolated from each other. By putting the protector in a penetration box, we keep the lightning away from susceptible components. This design also makes a good path to Earth for the lightning current. Although future cabinet design is moving in this direction, we still must protect existing equipment. Here's an example of a fairly well-designed controller cabinet. Power and communications cables enter through the bottom of the cabinet. Power cables run up to circuit breakers. We have EDCO suppressors followed by an RFI filter in parallel with the EDCO suppressor. The ground rod is a 5 8 inch galvanized rod with a copper bolted connection. Solid number six runs over to the chassis. The neutral and the ground are connected because code permits it. We have metal oxide varistors on various load lines. And over in this corner, finally, we have uh, three terminal spark gaps on the vehicle loop detectors and communications lines. You can't fully protect traffic controllers from electromagnetic threats without proper shielding, grounding, bonding, and maintenance. Here are the techniques and practices that assure maximum protection. Without grounding, protectors don't work. Both the National Electrical Code and local codes specify grounding practices that meet personnel safety requirements. These practices are not adequate for proper protector performance. Lightning grounds require a much lower impedance path to earth than safety ground. They need to be short, wide metal paths to accommodate lightning pulse. That's why a metal cabinet is better than the wire specified by code. In fact, you need to make sure that the electrical ground wire or green wire with AC surface and the ground rod are interconnected through the controller cabinet. Ground rods provide the necessary path to earth for lightning and fault current. The path from the ground rod to the cabinet must have low impedance. So make the connection between the ground rod and the cabinet with the shortest possible length of wire. We recommend a copper-clad bare wire, number 6 gauge, or heavier. Standard 8 to 10 foot lengths of copper-clad steel or galvanized steel rods should be adequate for the earth ground in most cases. For large installations, it may be necessary to use larger rods and multiple rods to form a grid. After installation, follow the procedures in NCHRP report number 317 to measure its resistance to earth. When direct contact with earth is impossible, at intersections on a bridge, you can ground to water pipe, reinforcing steel, or support pilot. Pole grounds are installed by the power company. They connect the distribution ground cable to earth. Since the distribution ground cable is usually the highest conductor on the power line, it's frequently struck by light. So you don't want to attach support or messenger cables directed to the pole ground. Support messenger cables on separate poles. Place the support poles at least six feet away from the power pole. Install separate grounds for each support pole. Ground the messenger wires to the support pole ground rod. If you don't have six feet of space, interconnect the support pole rod to the power pole ground with nothing smaller than a buried bare number six copper cable. Ultimately, good grounding depends on good bonds. Bonding makes those low impedance connections between conductors. 
Because of their permanent nature, exothermic welds are preferred over clamps in making the connection of the ground rod wire to the ground rod. Here's a demonstration of exothermic welding. First, carefully read the manufacturer's instructions for safety precautions. Next, clean the top of the rod and the end of the wire. Then, slide the exothermic weld crucible over the end of the rod and slide the wire in related parts in place. Drop the disc in, pour the weld material in, place the cap on the crucible, and then pour the igniting material onto the cap. Ignite the weld material using a flint striker and you are done. You can break the crucible, check the weld after about 30 seconds, but be careful, it's very hot. For most connections, welding is impractical. When you can't weld, use bolts or screws. Never use solder by itself in lightning or a fault discharge path. And don't use rivets for electrical bonding. No matter which method you use, be sure to clean the contacting surface as well. When you have to bond to dissimilar metal, use approved bimetallic fasteners or treat the surfaces as described in the manual. Bonds are an important part of shielding too. Shields protect against radiating energy that can upset controllers. The perfect shield is a metal box with no open, but that's impractical. The next best shield is a box well bonded to seam and properly treated opening. Cabinet seams should be welded and openings should be covered with wire screen or a metal gas. Unfortunately, that's costly. The good news is it's not necessary in most cases. When is it necessary? If the controller is near an air traffic control radar, a broadcast tower, or a military installation, you'll want that maximum protection because electromagnetic interference is more of a threat. Cable shielding is another important part of lightning protection. If you're puzzled about the proper grounding of cable shields, you're not alone. Many professionals are confused because cable shields provide an electromagnetic barrier while at the same time they serve as pickup paths for lightning. There is no perfect solution. For maximum protection against lightning and other electromagnetic threats, ground the cable shield of the cabinets on both ends. We recommend using connectors that completely enclose the cable inner conductor. This is peripheral bonding. Grounding at both ends creates ground loop and cause problems in some circuits like inductive loop detector input. If you can't ground one end of a cable shield, connect a suppressor between shield and ground to prevent arcing to the inner conductor. Whenever possible, eliminate all openings in the cable shield. If you bond the cable shield peripherally at both ends, you provide a closed electromagnetic barrier. When you can't avoid pigtails, be sure to keep them as short as possible. To combat ground loop turns, use the rejection techniques described in the user's manual. Once the traffic controller is fully protected, you can save hours of repair work and keep traffic moving if you follow up with periodic inspection. Check each box you're assigned during repair calls and routinely at least once a year. Look for several key indicators that fall into two categories. The first category is evidence of light. Look for cracked or burned arresters, circuits, and components. Check for carbon track, melt point and discoloration on wires and terminals. Blown fuses and tripped breakers are also signs of lightning damage. Normal wear and tear is the second category. Look for corrosion, particularly in bonds at cabinet connections, ground wires, and arrestor leads. Use your ohmmeter to check for electrical continuity across corroded joints. Corrosion will be obvious. You may have to search harder for broken wires, especially in arrestor leads. Make sure that all ground wires are unbroken and connected. Temperature changes loosen wires, so test for loose bonds, particularly where bolts or screws are used. Pay attention to bonds and grounding conductors. If the ground rod connection is bolted, be sure to check it for corrosion and loosening. When your maintenance check is complete, replace the damaged components, clean and tighten the connection. By the way, if you're working on a controller in cold, dry weather, you'll want to avoid static discharge. 
Did you know that modern solid-state electronics can be damaged by an electrostatic discharge even if the electronics aren't operating? It's true. So before touching any solid-state circuitry or printed circuit boards, you need to touch or connect to a solidly grounded object, like the equipment cabinet. Same for working on a bench in the repair shop. Ground your tool and put conductive pads on the work surface. Ground your rolling chairs and carts, or roll them on a conductive pad that's tied to a ground. We recommend wearing a conductive wrist strap while you work. You've just seen the basic guidelines of good traffic control or protection, but certain situations may require special attention. The user's manual explains these procedures in greater detail, or you may contact controller manufacturers or arrestor manufacturers for more specific information. You can also consult NCHRP Report 317 for background information, assistance in design, and formulation of performance specifications. To get a copy, call the Transportation Research Board Publications Office at area code 202-334-3218. Make your job easier. Specify and purchase transient protected signal controllers in the first place. And if you maintain your protected traffic controllers properly, You'll keep traffic moving everywhere. We live in the age of the automobile, an age where despite energy shortage, rising operating costs, and mass transport options, over 124 million passenger vehicles alone are registered in America, each averaging over 9,000 miles of travel annually. This ever-increasing volume of traffic has stimulated various methods of traffic management to minimize congestion, driving costs, and driver frustration. Today. Through the use of modern vehicle detection devices, combined with computer technology, it is possible to monitor vehicle speed, to record traffic volume, to create elaborate signal systems, to display various warning signs, and even to reroute traffic away from problem areas. Vehicle detectors originally evolved for traffic signal control in the late 1920s, as increasing traffic volumes made it apparent that fixed time signals had limitations. Fixed time signal controllers are mechanical devices with a fixed sequence of right-of-way assignments. Although these were once the standard for signal control, their inability to respond to traffic flow and direction soon proved wasteful and unsatisfactory. In 1928, the first vehicle detector was installed at an intersection in Baltimore. A small microphone mounted on a lamppost activated a signal switch when a car horn sounded. <coughs> Although this may have been convenient for the waiting driver, it wasn't too popular with the neighbors. Various other detector systems have evolved since that crude beginning, such as pressure sensitive, radar, magnetic, magnetometer, sonic, and self-powered system. Currently, the most widely used type is the inductive loop detector. This consists of one or more loops of wire wound into slots cut into the pavement. These loops are connected by a lead-in cable to a detector unit that serves as an AC power source. 
The combined lengths of the loop wires and lead-in cable dictate a certain natural frequency of vibration for that system. The power source is adjusted to match this resonant frequency, creating a tuned circuit. Current flowing through the wire creates an electromagnetic field around the loop. This field can be illustrated as lines of force or flux surrounding the wire, which contain energy. When a vehicle enters this field, eddy currents are induced into the metal of the body and frame, reducing the lines of force, a kind of absorption of energy from the loop. This absorption causes a decrease in the self-inductance of the loop, which in turn raises the frequency at which the loop will resonate. Some detector units respond to this by means of feedback circuitry that increases their frequency of oscillation. Others respond to the phase shift between the loop oscillation and the reference oscillation. Either of these response designs activates an output relay in the detector unit, which sends a signal to a controller indicating that a vehicle is over the loop. Because of its flexibility in application, relatively low cost, and comparatively safe design, the inductive loop is the most common detector now in use. Recently, much research has been done by various agencies toward extending the lifespan of these detectors. In 1981, a project was undertaken by the Engineering Research and Development Bureau of the New York State Department of Transportation to study inductive loop detector failures. The study's purpose was to identify how and why these detectors fail and how to prevent or reduce these failures in order to improve their life expectancy. The first phase of the project included a field survey of over 300 failed loops. Failure types were documented in the field and then analyzed by a statistically based computer program. In most instances, failures could be attributed to one or more of the following factors. Design and installation methods, sealer reliability, and wire durability. The formulation of solutions to these problems became the major areas of study and evaluation in the second phase of the project. The question of loop placement was examined first. Because this system includes wire loops only inches below the road surface, and lead-in cables sometimes extending hundreds of feet, it is vulnerable to construction and repair of the roadway, walkways, curbing, and various utilities which often damage or destroy loop systems. Before the actual installation, the work site should be inspected to determine the location of utility lines which should be avoided. A check for scheduled construction in the work site area could also prevent these types of conflicts. After the exact installation site is chosen and proper safety measures are taken, detector installation should begin by marking the loop's outline on the pavement surface with chalk line, spray paint, or any other marking material. This outline is then used as a guide for sawing the slots. Formerly, loop patterns in New York State were cut according to this standard. Diagonal saw cuts at the corners were intended to limit the sharpness of bends in the installed wire but pavement sections at these corners were subject to breaking and popping out, thus leading to exposed wire and loop failure. In March of 1983, a new loop design was approved in New York State, in which the corners are cut square and then rounded. This new pattern decreases corner-related failures and at the same time requires less sawing. Masonry saws for loop installations are available in a range of sizes and sawing capabilities. This is an 18-horsepower saw with a diamond blade in a wet-cutting operation. This was found to be a most efficient method. An 18-horsepower saw is preferable to the widely used 9.5-horsepower model. The smaller model is slower and breaks down frequently due to excessive workload. A variety of saw blades can also be used in loop installation, but the diamond blade is considerably faster, neater, and perhaps safer than traditional dry-cutting abrasive blades. There are two acceptable methods to prepare corners in the new loop design. One is to remove a core to the full depth of the sawed slot from each corner and then round all rough and sharp edges. The other, more popular method is to use a small air hammer to chip back the sharp edge, making a smooth, curved surface for the signal wire to bend around. When the corners are completed, the saw slot must be cleaned in preparation for sealant installation. In the past, this was done by blowing compressed air into the slot. This method was found ineffective in slot cleaning 
because it left fine debris dried on the inside of the slot. This debris prevented proper bonding of the embedding sealer to the inside of the slot and eventually led to detector failure. One effective way to clean the slot is to use this hydroblasting system. This system has a nozzle that, by using the Venturi principle, combines water with compressed air to give a hydroblasting effect sufficient to clear away any debris left in the slot. Once clean, the slot must be dried completely before wire installation. This can be done by using the same instrument with the water supply disconnected. Based on the failure survey, a large percentage of failures could be prevented by using a more durable wire. Most failed loop systems studied were constructed according to a specification calling for 14-gauge stranded copper signal cable with a polyethylene insulation. This wire could not survive the stresses caused by even minor pavement disruption, such as creeping, cracking, and thermal expansion and contraction. Nor could it withstand exposure to water and debris from minor sealant failure. It was found that the use of 14-gauge stranded copper wire, loosely encased in a flexible vinyl tube, had been very successful in other states' loop detector installation. With the loop wire loosely encased, it is free to move in the tube and can compensate for pavement disruptions by distributing tension throughout the entire length of the wire. Encasement also provides additional protection from water and abrasive debris. The incorporation of tube encased signal wire was carefully evaluated. It was found that a wider and deeper slot is necessary to accommodate this type of wire, resulting in increased saw cutting and sealant costs. There is also an increase in the cost of the wire itself, but increased material and installation costs are greatly offset by the resulting extended loop life. Once the proper number of wire loops are in the slot, the wire's two ends are wound together for the specified number of twists per foot. They are then threaded through a conduit into a pull box where an electrical inspection is performed and recorded. This includes measurements for leakage to ground, loop resistance, correct inductance, and induced voltage. Wire splicing in a loop system is done basically in two steps. The first, physically connecting the wire end, can be done by soldering, a screw and nut, or a crimping method shown here. The second step is to environmentally seal the splice by either applying several layers of various re-insulating materials or by encapsulating the spliced area in a container filled with embedding sealant. Another cause for loop failure is called wire float. When the embedding sealant is soft and plastic, the wire has a tendency to float up to the surface exposing itself to the abrasive effects of traffic. Since some sealants remain soft, this can also happen after the sealant's curing, depending on the product used. To avoid this, various materials can be used to hold down the loop wire. Hold down should be placed at all corners, wherever the loop wire changes direction, and spaced at two-foot intervals around the entire saw slot. A material well suited for this purpose is an open-celled foam rubber backer rod. This material is readily available, easy to work with, and is unaffected by most sealants or their installation temperature. When using this one half inch diameter backer rod, one inch long strips are torn off and pushed into the three eighths inch wide slot. Another major problem area is embedding sealant failure, which includes cracking, debonding, shrinking, tracking and running out of the slot, or poor encapsulation of wire, all of which lead to loop failure. Bituminous-based materials, or hot tars, have been popular in the past because they were relatively inexpensive and easy to obtain. However, several problems exist with use of these materials. Most bituminous sealers must be heated to a pourable temperature, sometimes exceeding the melting point of the wire insulation, which, when damaged, will lose its protective property. Working with this heated material has proved dangerous to both workers and nearby pedestrians. Hot tars also become soft in warm weather and can be tracked out of the slot or contaminated by dirt and debris. This makes it necessary to clean and reseal the slot regularly. 
A laboratory testing and evaluation program was developed by the Materials Bureau to produce specifications for acceptable sealants. Sealants were tested for curing time, water absorption, hot light, wire encapsulation, tensile strength, and adhesion. Based on this testing and extensive field evaluation, the best sealants for this purpose were found to be cold poured epoxy or epoxy resin material. They have excellent bonding capability, are durable, and resist effects of weather and provide good encapsulation of the loop wire. These cold poured sealants also diminish installation hazard and increase detector cost effectiveness by reducing periodic maintenance. A V-shaped squeegee can be used to scrape excess sealant into the slot. This reduces sealant waste and leaves the cured sealant flush with the road surface or even slightly below the surface where it is better protected from traffic. After sealing the slot, a light dusting of Portland cement may be added to prevent tracking out if the surface of the cured sealant is still tacky. This completes the installation. Through use of these installation techniques and similar materials, the dependability of inductive loop detectors has been much improved in other states, such as Illinois and Connecticut. They both formally experienced an annual replacement rate of about 20%, as did New York State. After several years of using these improved installation techniques, their current annual rate of replacement has fallen to nearly 1%. If New York State accomplishes a similar improvement, annual replacement costs of over 3,400 of these detectors may be saved. This could translate into about $7 million of maintenance funds. The motoring public will also benefit directly from safer, more efficient travel with better inductive loop detectors. Cold working of aluminum alloy is essentially the result of applying sufficient force to the metal to cause permanent deformation. This is true whether the force is applied by hand, by hammer, or through machines of large load capacity, such as the drop hammer. These operations result in strain hardening or strengthening of the metal. The basis of this lies in the aluminum alloy itself. Microscopic study of a cross-section of an aluminum alloy specimen reveals a network formed by the boundaries between grains of the metal. Each grain is an accumulation of individual crystals or unit cells. The single crystal or unit cell is conceived to be cube-shaped with atoms of the metal arranged in regular order one at each corner and one in the center of each face of the cube. These unit cells combine to form what is known as a space lattice. 
Within the space lattice, metal atoms exist in families of parallel planes with definite spacings between the planes. It is along these planes of weakness, called slip planes, that the crystal is most likely to glide or slip when deformed. These are important slip planes, along which movement may take place in the aluminum crystal. Through such movement, a crystal may undergo two types of deformation. The first is called elastic deformation. When small external forces are applied to the crystal, atoms on the lattice are moved slightly from their normal positions and the lattice structure is skewed. When the forces are removed, the atoms return to their original position and the lattice recovers its normal shape. The second type, plastic deformation, occurs when the applied force is increased beyond the elastic limit of the crystal. The space lattice yields. In the process of twinning, the lattice is deformed by some fraction of an atomic spacing. In slip displacement, the blocks of atoms move an integral number of atomic spacing. When the external force is removed, the atoms are so far from their original positions that they cannot return. Plastic deformation is the basic process underlying the strengthening and hardening of aluminum alloys through cold working. If the force had been increased beyond the metal's ultimate strength, the crystal would have been sheared or ruptured. In sliding over each other in plastic deformation, the crystal blocks rotate causing the crystal to become elongated. In tension, the crystal is stretched parallel to the axis of tension. In compression, the crystal is stretched perpendicular to the axis of compression. It is by this process that the metal grains become elongated and uniformly oriented when an alloy is cold work. Essentially the same action is involved in the plastic deformation of the polycrystalline grains composing an alloy specimen. Before deformation, these grains are randomly oriented and the slip planes for each grain are lined up in different directions. When a load is applied to the metal, the stresses are transmitted from grain to grain. Some begin to deform by slippage before others. Within each grain, the crystal blocks rotate to produce elongation. The deformation and rotation of any one grain is restricted by the differently oriented grains adjacent to it. These may also be rotating. Consequently, there is movement along the boundaries as well as along the slip plane. Each grain is now rotating, moving along its active slip planes toward the axis of tension or away from the axis of compression. The grains are now elongated and oriented in the direction of flow. Beyond this point, Severe cold working may lead to more violent deformation in which fragmentation and crushing of the grains occur. The total effect is to increase the metal's strength and hardness. One explanation of this effect is that disturbance along the slip planes and grain boundaries produces an amorphous material having no crystalline structure and therefore no planes of weakness. Thin layers of this material stronger than the parent alloy, form along the slip planes and grain boundaries and serve as a cement 
to bolster resistance to further slip. Another theory, the fragmentation theory, states that during plastic deformation, minute crystal fragments break off and fall along the slip planes and grain boundaries. These fragments interfere mechanically with further slip by increasing the friction between crystal blocks and between grains. A third explanation, the lattice distortion theory, assumes that the crystal planes become bent and twisted during plastic deformation. The distortion of these planes, and also of the lattice structure at the grain boundaries, increases the resistance to further slip. The strengthening and hardening effects of cold working may be reduced or removed by means of the annealing process, which changes the metal to its soft condition, generally designated as s cold. An aluminum alloy specimen that has been cold worked is in a condition of stress. In the annealing of a strain hardened alloy, heat is applied to the metal. The initial effect is a partial removal of the stresses caused by cold work. At this point, grain size and shape remain unchanged. When the temperature is raised to a point called the recrystallization temperature, nuclei of new grains are formed from the fragments and crushed particles of the original grain. As the metal is heated above the recrystallization temperature, but below the melting point, these stress-free crystal nuclei grow into new equiac grains by merging with the other nuclei and by accretion of material from the surrounding stressed metal. At elevated temperatures, the new grains may become quite large. The alloy is now in its annealed or soft condition. When necessary, the strengthening and hardening effects of heat treatment may be removed by annealing. The solution heat treatment of an aluminum alloy, such as 24S, involves the further dispersion of the alloying element throughout the aluminum in minute particles and, following a rapid quench, the precipitation out of solution of some of the copper in the form of fine submicroscopic particles of copper aluminum compounds. In the annealing of a heat treated alloy, the metal is heated at temperatures below the heat treating range. The effect is to increase and accelerate the precipitation of this copper aluminum compound from solution in coarse particles. This reduces the strengthening effect of the previous heat treatment. The alloy is now in its annealed or soft condition. Cold working or strain hardening operations may be undertaken for two purposes. First, to improve the physical properties of an alloy, Cold rolling and stretching processes are generally employed. The second purpose of cold working is to form parts from alloys with strain hardening resulting from the operation. This involves such processes as bending, hammering, hydropress forming, stretch forming, drop hammering, and deep drawing. A pair of oppositely driven cylindrical rolls is the mechanical basis of the cold rolling process. A series of such pairs of rolls is used, the roll opening of each pair becoming progressively smaller. The passage of the ingot through successive pairs of rolls reduces the thickness of the metal. In the process of cold rolling, the equiax grains are flattened and elongated.
The stretching process is based on the action of vice-like grip, in which the edges of the aluminum alloy section are inserted. As the tensile load is applied through the grip, the metal is stretched, the equiax grains becoming elongated and oriented in the direction of the applied load. These grain changes increase the strength and hardness of the metal. For example, strain hardening caused by rolling or stretching a specimen of aluminum alloy 52S might increase the alloy's tensile strength from 29,000 pounds per square inch to 41,000 pounds per square inch and raise the metal's Rockwell hardness number from H88 to H103. The primary function of the various forming methods is to convert the aluminum alloys into desired shape. Strain hardening accompanies these cold working operations and in extreme cases, annealing between operations may become necessary. Some forming operations require fully annealed or soft material. Operations such as bending may be performed by hand or by machine. This machine is used to bend metal sections that have already been formed, such as half sections. Its basic operation is the passing of the part through a pair of rolls. As the part emerges, it is bent to the proper radius by a rubbing shoe, which is swung up to the required height. The power press brake may be employed to produce bends in aluminum alloy sheet. The ram of the press brake moves downward, exerting its load through the punch. The punch forces the alloy sheet into the die, forming the bend. Stretch press forming of aluminum alloy sheet is designed chiefly for the fabrication of parts with double curvatures. In stretch press forming, the opposite ends of a section of aluminum sheet are inserted into clamps. The die, located on a table midway between the clamps, moves upward, contacts the alloy sheet, and stretches it beyond the metal's elastic limit. The sheet is now plastically deformed to the shape of the die. Hammering is another forming method that may be done either by hand or with the use of automatic devices. The process of drop hammering, capable of handling large parts and forming severe shapes with compound curvatures, may be performed with a rope-operated hammer or a pneumatic hammer. Hydraulic hammers are also used but less extensively than either of the other two types. A desired part may be formed by a single blow of the hammer, the alloy sheet being shaped by pressure between the mated punch and die. For parts having deep draws or sharp corners, a series of blows may be necessary involving the use of a set of progressive dies. The effect of hammering is to stretch the metal in one direction and to compress it at right angles to the stretch. The bending or shaping to double curvature of a number of parts at once is accomplished by use of a hydro press. The parts to be formed are loaded on a table the alloy sections being placed on forming blocks or dies. The table is moved under the press, the action of which is single and continuous. 
The action of the hydro press is based on the use of a rubber blanket in place of the upper die. When it is brought down upon the loaded table, the rubber pad transmits pressure in a fluid-like manner, forcing the metal to the shape of the die. Under the type of load applied in the bending and stretch forming processes, the grain structure of the aluminum alloy changes in a manner similar to that shown for the cold rolling and stretching processes. The grains rotate along the active slip planes and become elongated, and the metal is strain hardened. The cold working involved in the hammering, hydropress forming, drop hammering, and deep drawing operation results in grain rotation and elongation. But since the plastic deformation is generally more severe, fragmentation and crushing of the grains also occur. The fact that severe cold working results from such operations as drop hammering and deep drawing gives rise to the need for an annealing or softening process between blows or other forming operations in order to prevent rupture of the part. In order to remove the effect of cold working and to soften the alloy for further forming operations, the strain hardened alloy is annealed in an air furnace. Annealing is done at approximately 650 degrees Fahrenheit and its effects are almost instantaneous. Annealing first relieves the internal stresses caused by cold work. As the metal is heated to recrystallization temperature and above, the nuclei of new grains are formed from the fragments and crushed particles of the original grain. These nuclei may merge with other fractured particles or with portions of the original grains growing into new stress-free grain. The metal is now annealed and in a soft condition for further forming. If an aluminum alloy part has been strengthened through heat treatment and then strain hardened in the course of a forming operation, the effect of cold working and part of the effect of heat treatment may be removed by partially annealing the alloy in an air furnace. The partial annealing is performed at approximately 700 degrees Fahrenheit. The metal is kept in the furnace for about 30 minutes and then is quenched. The first internal change in the partial annealing is the relief of the cold work stressed grains and the recrystallization of the metal into new stress-free grains. The second change, resulting in partial removal of the effects of heat treatment, is the partial precipitation of the CuAl2 particles out of solution throughout the newly formed grain. The quench prevents this precipitation from becoming complete. Full annealing to remove the effects of both cold working and heat treatment, or of heat treatment alone, is accomplished by heating at approximately 800 degrees Fahrenheit for from one to two hours. The alloy parts are then allowed to cool slowly in the furnace. Once more, the first internal change is that of recrystallization, removing the effects of any cold working that may have been present. But this time, in the second change, most of the CuAl2 is precipitated out of solution in the form of coarse particles. The metal is now in the annealed or soft condition. Remember that in cold working, the physical properties of an aluminum alloy 
are affected by the deformation of the alloy grain. But in heat treatment, control of the physical properties is achieved by controlling the size and distribution of the particles of the alloy constituent. This is accomplished by solution heat treatment, age hardening, and annealing. 